Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today I'm gonna show you how I build my bike start to finish and show you a few tricks and pro tips along the way. The bike I'm gonna build today is a Cube Stereo 150. It's a carbon trail bike, 160, 150 travel. Uh, that's a bike I was using most of the time last year. It's a very capable trail bike, but also super light, so it pedals really well, super fun to ride. But end of last year, what I got was a Cube Stereo 170. So what it is, it's basically a bigger trail bike, more travel, so 170 millimeter travel. Uh, it's slacker, it's a bit longer, and it's just a bit more capable. You can do, I guess, more hugs. You, it's, it's, it's a bias more comfortable when the terrain gets gnarlier, but obviously it's a bit heavier. So I really like to have both, and the Cube Zero 150 is basically the bike I'm gonna be riding most of the time, and I'm gonna keep this one for the bigger stuff. This video is sponsored by Jenson USA. Jenson is an online bike shop. Uh, they are one of my main partners for the 2020 and 2021. You can purchase basically any of the parts I'm using on their website. When you make a purchase using the link that's in the description of this video, you basically support this channel and you help me to make better and more content for you to enjoy. First thing I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna mount the shock on the bike because I've been riding the same bike before. I'm familiar with the settings. So what I want to do is that I want to add some volume spacer inside the positive chamber and what it does is that it's going to make the bike more progressive uh, so basically I get more support and bigger impact and that avoids the bike to just bottom out and sink in the travel too much. So I've been removing the air using the pump and now I'm going to pop this little seal out. Oh, there we go. And then I'm going to remove the cam. Negative chamber, positive chamber, so I'm gonna put the spacer on the positive chamber. Uh, what that does is that that makes the bike more progressive. Just like this, super easy, and then I slide back the can. Up. And uh, I put back the seal. So now we're gonna put the shock hardware. Uh, I'll pump the shock back and equalize it later on once the bike is built. So I don't have the seat post yet, so I'm just gonna put very lightly the frame here. So I'm not clamping it hard, just enough so I can mount the shock. So I'm just gonna grease the bolts, but also the shock, that's a trillion mount. Just a bit of grease. And now let's put the shock on the bike. So right now I'm just gently tightening everything, but I'll use the torque wrench at the end to control everything. For wheels, I'm gonna be using the E13 LG1 Air Enduro carbon wheels I've been on for the last three years. First thing I'm gonna do is the valve. So the rim already starts with the tape, so that's easy. You just slide this in. That little spacer here. You want to make sure the tire bead goes above the valve like this, otherwise it's gonna make it complicated. And then we're gonna put some tubeless sealants. So for sealant, same, I don't measure, but I put a bit less on the front wheel than I do on the rear wheel, just to save weight. And also, I'm usually less likely to make a hole on the tire on the front than I am on the back. So this is sealant, so I need to be careful so I don't pull it everywhere. So what I do, I just bring the sealant on the side of the valve, like this, and I start clipping the tire at the opposite. Now I'm going to pump the tire, but we're going to charge the pump first. So that pump, it's a topic. You basically, there's a chamber so you can charge it. So right now I'm just putting air in the pump and then I'm going to release it into the tire. So everything is going to go at once in the tire, which is going to uh, allow the tubeless to uh, seal onto the rim. So even if I have the tire clap against the rim, I always make sure that the bead is perfectly set up against the rim. Uh, that way I know that the tire is going to stay on the rim. Now that the wheel is done, I usually put the cassette on. So that's an E13 12 speed 946, so 511% of range. All I need is this tool. I don't really know how it's called in English actually. So I'm going to push the cassette onto the clear body. Once I'm at the bottom, I'm just gonna tighten that. No need to tighten it too hard, just a little bit. If you look, there is a sign here with a lock. 
So I'm gonna try to align it. It's right there. So I push it as far as it goes. And then I use this thing, it's called a chain whip actually. And I lock it. Now to make sure it's not gonna move, E13 has designed this little screw. So it's only one Newton, so it's very light. It's just to make sure the cassette doesn't come loose. Following the cassette, the next obvious step is the disc. So I'm running for A, so I'm gonna use uh, the disc. I put a 180 on the back, on this bike, and a 203 on the front. On the Cube Steel 170, I run 200 front and back. Uh, but for this bike, because I'm mostly gonna pedal with it, and I'm gonna do shorter laps in Squamish, I don't really need the power and the endurance of a 203 on the back. So just a 180 is plenty of power for me. Especially I'm a lighter rider, I'm about 145 pounds. So I don't really need uh, any more than the 180. So I'm using a regular T25 uh, to put the, the screws, but then I'm using a drill and I set it up at five Newton meter. So that way I don't go too deep. And then I go back to my regular T25 to just make sure uh, everything is tight enough. Now that we're gonna start working around the frame, the first thing I'm gonna do is put the cable for the hydraulic seat post, and that way I can mount the seat post first, so I can mount the bike secure onto the bike stand. The reason why I put the seat post right now is just so I can clamp it onto uh, the bike stand uh, without damaging the bike. I will, you know, make the housing and make everything good once I have the forks on and the bars. So I know exactly where the shifter is going to be uh, on my bars and I can cut uh, the housing at the right line. So what I do is that I do a little hook with uh, with the old spoke, and that allows me to grab the cable a bit easier. Yep. So now I have that guide. My cable is tied to the guide, and now I can just pull it back. So now I'm done with the internal routing for the rear there, and I'm gonna move on onto the brake. The reason why we did uh, the rear there and we're gonna do the brake is because they come right um, into the headset, and if you have the fork key, that can be tricky to get the cables out. So we put the cable first, and then we'll put the fork so that makes it easier. Now we're gonna move onto the brake. Um, so I'm just gonna unscrew this because we have to cut the cable in order to fit it in the frame. So once you remove the cable, you can keep the lever like this, so that way the fluid doesn't come out. So when you've put in your internal cable inside the frame and everything went well, it's pretty satisfying. I'm just gonna rotate my caliper like this, so that way the cable stay uh, towards the inside and uh, doesn't go into the spokes. So in order to avoid like this noise, uh, when you ride, I usually put this little thing inside the inside the down tube. So what that does is that it just like avoid uh, any noise basically. So now this is super secure, there is no way cables are gonna make any noise on the frame and like a quiet bike is a fast bike. Uh, so this is done, we're gonna move to the bottom bracket. I don't have the press to put it, uh, but it's a carbon frame 
and it's not super tight on the rotor bottom bracket so I usually mount it just, uh, just with a little hammer and it's a bit of uh, do it yourself but uh, maybe that will work for you on your own bike so I'm gonna show you that so I try to tap in a circle that way it comes uh, like smoothly So I've done that the last three years on every single of my bike and I haven't had one single issue. So you see that's a rubber mallet. Uh, make sure you don't use a metal wallet, especially if you have a carbon frame, if you ever miss it. Uh, but just be very careful when using that. So I just put uh, grease basically everywhere on the axle and the cranks. Just make sure there's no creaking noise or anything. And uh, it just runs smoothly and for a while. E13 made a system that's super easy to use. You can just slide the stuff. You can also do it when you have the cranks in. So I'm using the one up bars, the carbon bars. So what I like to do is that I put some carbon paste onto the stem. Uh, that way it just like allows the bar to uh, not slide on the stem. It's basically a grease with some sand and uh, that makes it grippy on the bars. Now we're moving on to the fork. This is called a crown race. It's basically what fits in the headset, so there's no play. Um, I don't have the correct tool to pull it, so what I use is that I use an old bearing and I slowly tap with a flat screwdriver and a hammer. You go all around it, slowly, until, uh, until it fits in. So now we're gonna cut my steer tube. Fortunately, I still have my bike from last year, so it's pretty easy. Same bike, same fork. So what I'm gonna do is just measure, so from the top of the crown, so it's about 16.5 centimeters. So I make sure I'm just at the mark and I use a pipe cutter. Uh, it's just slightly longer than cutting, but it makes it a bit easier and, uh, and a bit cleaner. This year I write for one up components and I'm using the EDC cap. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna tap the steer tube of the fork, that way I don't have to use a star. So I put some oil on the tool, just to make sure everything goes good. So it's super easy, just put that in. I use the cardboard in order to protect the fork. You just make sure this is well set up. Use 8mm Allen key and you just turn. So you do half a turn, quarter of a turn. So now the allen key is bottom out on the tool, so that means I've done everything. And now I just slowly unscrew. And it's super smooth. And that system is really cool. Uh, you can mount the tool obviously on your fork, but it's mostly that, uh, for me it's more reliable than a star never comes loose so there we go and look at the thread because I tap the steer tube there is some shaving and you want to make sure that the shaving don't go onto your fork seals so just slowly tap the fork so we are now installing the fork uh, I'm gonna put some grease just right there where I tapped uh, the steer tube also I'm gonna put some grease obviously uh, on the crown race because there's a bearing that's gonna sit on it as well as on the frame so I make sure that everything is gonna be smooth and, uh, and there's no creaking noise or no play. Okay now I'm pulling the fork. 
So this headset is really easy because it's integrated. So I basically just have to put the bearing on. Then I put this thing. I don't even know how it's called. Um, and it just fits right onto the bearing. This must be called uh, headset cover or something like that. Once I've set up the headset, I put uh, the spacer. And if you look, all the spacer I use are different size and they're all super small. The reason behind that is that way, if I ever need to move the height of the stem, which I do a lot depending on the kind of writing I do, I just have to put uh, a spacer above or under the stem depending what I want to do. And that way I can get the exact position I want. Now I'm gonna install the mud hugger on my fork. Uh, so this is the long version. So obviously it protects uh, from the mud, but also from projection into your eyes. It also protects your seals uh, from the dust. So if you look at mine, it's slightly wet. And the reason is because I have a 29 front wheel. Um, and on some tires, it can like touch a little. So I just put it under the boiling water like this and I pour the boiling water and it's, what it does is that it just extends and makes it slightly less curved. I'm gonna first slide uh, the seat post lever. I'm very particular with how I run my the cockpit, and then I put the front brake. So right now I'm removing the brake pads, and there's two reasons behind that. First one is that I don't want to contaminate them when I'm gonna bleed the brakes. But also, when you buy a pair of AIDS brakes, they come with two different kinds of brake pads. Uh, those ones are semi-metallic, or you can get the sintered one, and I prefer the sintered one. I find them a little bit more powerful, and yeah, overall, they just uh, work out better for the kind of riding I'm doing. So I'm just gonna remove those and uh, change them for the other ones. So before I cut the brake line, uh, what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna put the grips, and normally, I run between four and five millimeter between the collar and the lever because I haven't cut the bar yet I need to take that in consideration so this is a 800 millimeter bar and on this bike I'm gonna run it at 750 which means I'm gonna cut 25 millimeter each side so because I will cut the bar at the end when the bike is good and I can sit on it uh, what I'm gonna do is that instead of having 5 millimeter gap I'm gonna have 5 millimeter plus 25 so I'm gonna have 30 millimeter gap Once I've shortened the brake line, what I'm using is a little nail, just to make sure that the hole is still round. And then I use a two millimeter Allen key, just to make it slightly bigger, so it's easier to put uh, the olive inside. Don't forget this part, uh, which is very important. It's to uh, press the olive. And then I put the olive. So I like to run my front brake pretty short, uh, that way there's not much noise. The bike stays pretty quiet because the cables aren't rattling into each other. So this brake has two adjustments. This is the reach and this one is the spacing in between the brake pads. So before I bleed, because I like to have like a tighter feel on the brake, I just unscrew it a little bit and that makes it easier to adjust afterwards than before bleeding. I always use some degreaser after I'm done beating the brake just to make sure there is no more residue of, uh, of oil that could potentially contaminate the brake pad.
So now we are done with the brakes. We're gonna do the rear there. This is a brand new rotor hydraulic transmission. It's a one by 13. I use it uh, as a 12 speed with the E13 cassette KMC chain. But same as the brake, you have to bleed. It's exactly the same idea. So if you can bleed the brakes, you can bleed the rear there. So let's pull it on. Just bled the brakes, I bled the rear there, everything is clean, I made sure there is no, no oil, nothing. So now I'm gonna put my sintered brake pads in. So now that I have my brake pads inside the brake, uh, one thing, like sometimes a little spring in between can rattle and cause noise, and I don't like to have uh, a noisy bike. So what I do, it's actually pretty simple, I take an old tire and I cut the sidewall, make two holes in between, and then I slide it in between the brake pads and the spring just like this. So it's a bit tricky, you can also do it with a tube, but it's not as durable. And uh, then you just pull it back the way it was. And that way you don't have any noise. I always put grease on the shred as well as on the axle. So now it starts to look like a bike. I'm gonna take care of the seat post. I'm gonna reduce the travel and then I'm gonna connect it to the cable. And so now I'm gonna put this little shim just to lose travel. So one is one centimeter, and so two, so that allows me to go from 180 to 160 millimeter. Shim stacks are in, so now I can just push them inside and just put back the seat post together. So right now I'm gonna set up the seat post height. Uh, I'm, I'm used to it. I know it's 70 centimeter from the top of the seat to the bottom bracket. So I'm just gonna do that on this one. Exactly 70. Good to go. For this bike, I'm gonna run my go-to pedal. It's a time special 12. Uh, as you can see, you can fit pins on the front and on the back. I'm only running the pins on the back uh, just because that gives me enough uh, grip and support when I'm clipped in. And the pins on the front only help you uh, when you are not clipped in. So I don't uh, use the pins on the front, just the one on the back. Little bit of grease, obviously. So even though that's an hydraulic rear there, that works pretty similar to a regular rear there. You got your bit tension here, so to adjust the distance in between uh, the pulley and the cassette. You got your limit screw right there. Here's your main adjustment that um, does the difference in between each gear. So how big is the gap? 
as well as the limit uh, for the little gear. You got your reset button here. So when you press on it, that allows you to drop to the last gear easily. And this is basically a bit like your cable tension. So when you screw it or unscrew it, it changes uh, basically how reactive is, is the lever. So it's pretty, pretty simple in the end. So right now I'm just checking the chain guide. Obviously I mounted it before, but I'm just making sure now that there is a chain on, uh, that the cranks are on, I make sure that everything is tight, everything is good to go. So I unclipped the top part, that way I can just drop the chain like this, and I can lower it slightly. So as you guys know, I don't like a bike that makes noise. Uh, so I'm using those STFU. It's a dampening system for your chain to kill any chain noise. I have a code, it's called Remy15 on stfubike.com. Uh, so I'm just gonna install them on the bike right now. I go on the biggest gear, put them on the chain stay like this, look at the height, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut a little bit of it because I want on my biggest gear to be at the top, but not touching uh, the top of the of the system, so just gonna cut it a little bit and then we're gonna install it. So I went on the smallest gear, open the chain guide, remove the chain, and now I'm gonna put the STFU. So in the same idea of keeping the bike quiet, as you can see right now, the cable could potentially rattle. So normally what I will do is that I will put a little piece of uh, rubber tape. I don't have any, so I'm gonna be using some, uh, some bar tape. Right now I'm putting the water bottle cage because I will not want a bike that doesn't fit water bottles. Bike is almost ready to go. Uh, obviously the bars are 800 millimeter. I'm gonna cut them, I'm a smaller rider. Uh, so let's do that. So the bars are marked from 800 all the way down to 740. Uh, what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna cut them slightly under 70 because my ergon grips stick out of the bars about 5 mm. So if I run 750 bars, in reality my bars will be 760 with the grip. So I'm gonna go slightly under at about 745. So because I don't have a carbon blade, I just have a regular metal blade, I just did a little mark and then I'm gonna wrap the bars with uh, electric tape. That way the carbon is not gonna spread out. Um, so I do this and with my nail I just find the crack I did, so it's right there. And now I'm gonna be able to cut with that and it's gonna be smoother and better to cut the carbon. But safety first. Now I'm just gonna make it perfect. And so now kind of my favorite part of building a bike is setting up the bars, brakes. Uh, one, one tip I have for you is to have your side on the suspension uh, correct. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, but it has to be close to what you're gonna ride. Because when you sit on the bike or stand up to, to uh, you know, set up your bars and, and your brake levers, your grips and stuff like that, you want the bike to be in the same position than when you're gonna ride it. So if your shock is too soft, the bike is gonna sag too much and it's gonna change your perception of your bars and stuff. So start by checking out your suspension just a little bit and then you move on to your, uh, to your cockpit. The first thing I'm gonna do is the grips. Uh, I make sure that the bars are in a, in a good position then I move on to the grips. Uh, what I really like about those G1 from Ergon is that you can slightly rotate them and because they have an ergonomic shape, what it does is that it changes your body position. So if I move them forward a little bit, that changes the up sweep of the grip and that's gonna bring my elbow a little bit higher so that way I can put more weight on the front wheel and have a better cornering position. So I run mine a little bit past the neutral point.
Now next step for the bars, obviously uh, my stem is straight. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna rotate them slightly on the front. Uh, you want this gap to be closed. So you only want to actually have to modulate uh, the two screws from the bottom. And then once I'm happy with the position, I'll use uh, a torque wrench to make sure that uh, it's not too tight because it's carbon bar, so I want to be careful with that. Grips and bar are good. Last touch on the brakes now. I'm gonna move in uh, that screw, which is the distance in between the brake pads. And I'm gonna open the reach a little bit. And I guess that's pretty good for me. So now I'm pretty much all set up. Uh, if you look, my rear brake and my front brake are set up differently. I run my rear brake further to the bars than I do with my front brake. They both at the same uh, level from the ground, but just my rear brake uh, bites to the brake pads earlier than my front brake does. Uh, so this is about a five millimeter difference. I do that because I use the front brake and the rear brake obviously for different purposes. Uh, I'm pretty hard with the front brake. I can lock the rear wheel easily, while the front brake I want to have power, but at the same time I want to have that like very good modulation, especially on like rock faces and, uh, and when I do nose manual. So that's why I run them uh, differently. And now we get into serious stuff, which is suspension. I've been on the same fork and shock for the last three years, so I'm obviously familiar with it. Uh, I'm gonna run 120 PSI on the fork, and then I'm gonna show you the low speed, high speed, uh, rebound, and sensitivity settings. In terms of compression, high speed, low speed. So for my high speed, I usually open it from fully closed by two turns. So that's one, one half, and two. Your high speed is more like super fast impact or big impact. It can be uh, like very fast rock garden or, or you know big drop. Uh, so I run it about half, which is two turns, and my low speed, which is more the overall support of the fork at low speed. So you know when you pedal standing up, um, when you brake on the front wheel a lot. I usually run two to three clicks out of six clicks. Um, three clicks, if I'm running pretty aggressive and I want a front end that's really uh, stay a bit high, and two clicks if I'm just cruising around. After setting up uh, the air on the fork, I'm gonna move to the rebound. On this fork, uh, I run 15 clicks out. So when it's fully closed, I open it 15 clicks. Rebound is super important because uh, it's, it's really, um, for me, like a safety aspect. If the fork runs back too fast, I might lose traction. If the rebound is too slow, I don't have enough traction. Uh, so it's really a compromise you have to find. And I change a lot the rebound depending on temperature, uh, also depending on air pressure. So if I'm gonna run a trail uh, that's you know gnarly and I'm going up in air pressure because there is bigger impact and going up in compression, I'm gonna slow down the rebound. Uh, if I'm more chill and I run a bit less air pressure, I'm gonna open up the rebound. At the bottom left of the fork, DVO offers the OTT, which is a sensitivity settings. Um, so you can run your fork more over plush at the start of the travel. I don't run mine uh, too plush or too stiff. I run it basically in the middle. If it's too plush, I feel I have some dead travel at the start, which I don't like. And if it's too stiff, obviously uh, I lose in terms of uh, comfort and, uh, and grip on smaller impact, so I run it on the, on the middle. You can also adjust the progressivity by adding some oil, but I run my fork completely stock. I do not change that. Uh, I'm super happy with how the fork uh, feels and takes even on, on very big impact. If I know I'm gonna do a very big drop, what I do is that I tie the high speed and I can do that just before jumping uh, when, I'm, when I'm looking at the feature. So, um, yeah, I haven't uh, had the need to change progressivity on this bike, so I've been super happy with it. Moving on to the shock now, as you saw at the start of the video, I've put three volume spacer on the positive chamber in order to make the shock ramp up, so the bike is going to be more progressive. After doing that, uh, we put some air inside the can. So I put 180 PSI, and right now I'm about 145 pounds. So for me, it's a good compromise between support and comfort. And in terms of rebound from fully closed, I've opened it from five clicks. Uh, one thing it's important to notice is that depending on the weather, depending on what kind of trail, I adjust a lot of suspension. Uh, so it's something I'm constantly doing. And I kind of like my final touch on the bike. I'm gonna tape together uh, the cables just so they avoid rattling. I use some electric black tape. Uh, I think I've used a lot of stuff before, but this is to me uh, the cleanest way. And 
and the best way. So right now it's winter in Squamish, so I'm gonna be using some wet loops, that way the transmission is gonna function better uh, on wet conditions. And now tire pressure, this is my favorite tool. Uh, it's called a pressure gauge. On the front wheel, I'm gonna run 18 or 19 PSI. In the summer, I'll normally be around 20, but right now it's super slippery and I'm definitely riding slower because of the condition. So I think with that tire at 18 PSI, I should be uh, having no issue in terms of reliability and the best grip. And on the back, I'm riding a DH casing, so I'm gonna go down to 20 PSI. Well, that's it, this bike is pretty much ready to go. Uh, I'm excited to go and put the tire on the dirt. Everything should be good and well set up. Obviously, I will do some minor adjustment once I'm on the trail. Uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel. You're gonna see plenty of riding video on this bike as well as trail preview. Let me know in the comment below if you have any question or if you have any details that you did not understand. Also, I would like to give a massive shout out to Jenson USA for supporting this video and for partnering with me for the next two years. They've been a great help so far. Uh, make sure to click the link in the description. That way you can support my channel and help me make more content and better content. I see you on YouTube or see you on the trails. Thank you.